change the relationship between uh, 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 industries like uh, the fashion and garment industry, uh, farming, uh, including dairy farmers, and also construction, to give the opportunity for uh, non-unionized workers to really leverage their power and change labor and working conditions uh, in the United States and across the world. So it's a little bit about um, our work. Um, this issue of Medicare for All is very near and dear to me. Um, I come from a public health background. <laughs> I spent uh, really the last 10 years um, prior to joining Partners this past September working in public health uh, as the communications director for Housing Works in New York City, if you're familiar with Housing Works as an offshoot of ACT UP New York, uh, and then later the policy director for Treatment Action Group, which is another ACT UP uh, offshoot organization based in New York City. And I was also the senior editor of a website called thebody.com, which focuses on news information um, uh, about uh, HIV and, uh, and LGBT health and sexual and reproductive health in the United States. So I'll turn it over to Ben to introduce uh, himself and then uh, we will jump into our presentation. Ben. Hey everyone, um, it's great to see so many faces here, uh, old friends and new folks as well. Um, I've been with Partners for Dignity and Rights uh, for a number of years and I think this is my seventh uh, strategy conference. So um, pleased to be here. Thanks, Ben. So uh, I'm going to share my screen now. We'll be um, doing a presentation um, on this issue about sort of how we see the ways in which media uh, plays a role in shaping the public conversation around um, healthcare and uh, social policy writ large, uh, and then talk about some particular the sort of past and present of, of those issues, and then also some work that we think we could be doing to help uh, better um, kind of promote uh, a single payer movement in uh, the current media landscape, uh, as it were. So real quick. All right, so just to get us started on uh, the conversation today, this is where we're entering the conversation. I think it's really important for us to um, first, pay attention to the ways in which um, health issues are um, a part of the national public discourse, uh, you know, right now. And I think this is obviously not a surprise to anybody in this meeting, but we are in a situation where we're in a global pandemic where the United States um, leads in a number of infections uh, and also uh, in number of deaths globally. We are now when we put this slide together, we were just passing 400,000. And uh, at my last look, we are now at like, I think uh, 411,000 and climbing um, with estimates for us to hit at least a half a million deaths uh, by spring um, and probably more before you know the end of this year when vaccines are more uh, kind of widely available. Um, two, um, you know, over half of Americans delay or don't get health care because they can't afford it. Um, I think many of us are also familiar with that issue. And, and one of the things that we've been able to see in the COVID-19 pandemic is while we're at 410,000 deaths and climbing of uh, people who have died from COVID specifically, we also um, know that there are more people who also have died because of the strain on the healthcare system that was not able to take care of folks um, suffering from other sort of conditions, right? Um, because of the strain of, of, of managing so many uh, uh, ICU beds and emergency rooms uh, due to COVID-19. Um, and then lastly, 79 million Americans have problems with medical bills um, or debt. Um, and so I think it's important to just think about that's where we are kind of, you know, entering, um, you know, this conversation in the US. And I'll say too, lastly, before I turn it over to Ben to sort of start us off in our more formal presentation, that, you know, this is not just about the sort of technical aspects of Medicare for all or the kind of legislative strategy, which I think all of us are very, um, you know, sort of healthcare and public health geeks kind of like myself. Uh, that we get most uh, kind of interested in. Um, but I think that we have to start thinking about this is really a political movement and, and a political struggle that is uh, both about the specifics of, of 
having a single payer healthcare system for every person living in the United States, but also um, about the ways in which we have to really dismantle um, systems of privatization in our system and also ways of dismantling the kind of thinking and rhetorics that allow us to create healthcare systems that decide who is deserving of health and who is not, right? And um, I want us to think about um, kind of those things, especially as we think about ways in which we develop media and communication strategies to meet the current moment. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Kenyon. Um, so we all have been following uh, how, <laughs> how Medicare for All is talked about in the mainstream media. And so what we're gonna do is do a little bit of background first, talk about sort of actually what's the deeper story, right? Because often the rhetoric around Medicare for All isn't just about this one piece of legislation. It's not even just about healthcare. Um, there's really a deeper struggle. And then we're gonna move into, after that, into um, some concrete, sort of strategies and tactics that folks can take um, to help reframe discussions. And then at the end, we'll have some time for question and answers. So uh, I'm just gonna move on <laughs> to the next slide. Um, so the struggle for Medicare for all is really a struggle for who are we as a country and um, how do we, what are our rights as, as citizens and as residents and what, how do we, um, Need to show up to for each other right as as a multiracial society um and of course a lot of the rhetoric we hear about medicare for all is oh you can't afford this oh it's a tax hike oh people like their insurance but these sorts of um things that the media just sort of repeats are actually rooted in really deep um ideologies and so there's been a racist attack on government and on people's health for centuries. And there's long been a corporate attack as well. So I'm just gonna walk us quickly through those. Um, this horrifying political ad is from 1866, right after emancipation, right after the Civil War. This is in the North in Pennsylvania. Um, and a candidate for governor um, ran this in newspapers. Um, and it, it sort of focuses on, you know, it says the Freedmen's Bureau, an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. It's this very explicit racialization, this characterization of black people um, as somehow subhuman, and which is juxtaposed with these hardworking, industrious white people in the bottom left, ch chopping wood and plowing fields, and the dutiful white woman sort of waiting on the sidelines. Um, and so when we hear these attacks on Medicare for all as an attack on government, um, it's tapping into this very deep sort of uh, racial, racialized subcontext um, that's basically pitting who are the deserving and hardworking people against who are not. Um, and that's not just about race, right? That's about poverty, that's about gender, that's about disability, that's about immigration status. But in the American politics, for just centuries, right? Race has always been at the center of this. Um, and so the, these quick, sort of notions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just one quick addition, Ben. I think what it, it also does, so it both paints, you know, the state as uh, caretaking for, for Black people, right? So the state as only providing quote unquote welfare assistance to Blacks, while it also, promotes this idea that uh, white people are self-sufficient, right? And the whole kind of frontierism and that white people have gained things in this country by hard work of their own volition and not relying on, on public policy or, you know, state programs to support, you know, the amassing of, of white land and wealth. Absolutely. And so there's phrases in here associated with white people. They're referred to as taxpayers and hardworking. Those are phrases we still hear today, right, over 150 years later. And then the phrases associated with Black people they have in here are no work and idleness. Um, so these themes carry right on through. So if we go to the next slide, I'm going to flash forward here to the 1930s and 40s, which is when the American Medical Association, although it exists in the 19th century, they actually took a vote in 1870, basically to bar black doctors. Um, by the 1930s, um, they hired this consulting firm of this wife and husband team here, Baxter and Whitaker, um, and really systematized this sort of what, what we now see as the corporate playbook that we've seen from big oil, big tobacco, big insurance, big hospitals, and everyone else. Um, 
And so they literally wrote the blueprint. Um, this is when the blueprint here was published in 1949. I'm just gonna walk through on the following slides um, a few sort of examples of the rhetoric they, they chose. So they, they wanted, this was when Harry Truman's um, universal health insurance plan was being proposed. And so they said, no, we don't want that, right? We want voluntary health insurance. This is the American way. This is about freedom and choice. Sound familiar to folks? Um, on the next slide, you'll see the flip side is what they painted universal healthcare through a public program as. Um, Kenny, can you move to the next slide? Um, so <laughs> universal healthcare, of course, was compulsion, state medicine, Congress forcing socialized medicine down your throats, right? These are very familiar to us, but have are long-standing tropes that have been in the media discourse for years and years and years. On the next slide, you'll see more familiar themes, right? So this is from the late 30s. This was actually um, a campaign against a California proposal to have um, expanded social security, but similar things to healthcare, right? So taxes, taxes are basically stealing your money, right? It's cutting your paycheck. You re need relief from tax burdens. These are very familiar themes. <laughs> and two more, on the next slide, we see um, this cartoon, how to see a doctor under socialized medicine. You have to line up and wait, wade through red tape, right? The, all these tropes of wait times um, bureaucracy, the sort of like um, unfeeling, overbearing system are very familiar. And on the next one, um, the last sort of set of themes from the 40s um, was this sort of notion that, oh, this is socialism, communism, this foreign anti-American conspiracy is very anti-Semitic trope. And so you have these sensationalist book covers, right? Sort of warning about America's creeping revolution, the burning of the flags, these sort of um, you know, prop, supposedly Jewish uh, puppeteers pulling the strings behind uh, socialized medicine and comparing Roosevelt to Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin. So, I mean, really over the top stuff. But this is this is always the subtext, right? That is 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 out there. Um, even if journalists are not intending to be voicing this stuff, when the, when things are framed in terms of overbearing government, this is part of of what is inevitably to this day is still coming up, right? Um, so on this next slide now, we'll zoom ahead again, uh, looking here at the 1950s and 60s when um, black healthcare workers and civil rights organizers and other folks really bound together to help lead the fight to win Medicare for and Medicaid. And once that fight was won, then actually to integrate hospitals, which was not a given, um, it was required by the law, but there's no plan for how to do it. Um, I saw folks on an earlier uh, workshop talking about the film, The Power to Heal. We're talking about uh, hopefully co-sponsoring a screening of that online. If anyone wants to collaborate, reach out to us. But um, so what organizers were doing, right, was fighting to integrate hospitals, integrate medical societies, really um, have finally create this sort of notion of full citizenship and have healthcare be a central part of that. And it became un, sort of suddenly politically unpalatable for the health, and, you know, for doctors and for um, organized opposition to use race explicitly. And so they started using these coded dog whistles, right? So again, you still hear these here as in this headline, this threat of socialized medicine. And they really leaned into this rhetoric of freedom and choice um, is, is really sort of like, oh, well, if, if we shouldn't force Southern hospitals to integrate or we shouldn't force states to do this, right? That's really a sort of a matter of independence and choice. Um, on the yeah, next and if slide, I could real quick yeah, yeah. sort of add, like, so the way in which these rhetorics come together. So because the right, you know, right wing and kind of, you know, white segregationists had already been like also very anti-communist, right? At the throughout this period that they would had already been tying you know civil rights movement to communism or socialism so to just say socialized medicine was already making the rhetorical connection between you know black freedom and and uh socialism right through in this case vis-a-vis -vis healthcare so that's part of how you start to see the sort of like dog whistling through the kind of red baiting that is also very much tied to race absolutely um, and in the ensuing decades, this is really systematized by politicians from Goldwater to Nixon to Reagan to Clinton. Um, 
And so, you know, here uh, Lee Atwater gave this quote anonymously, but said in 1981 when he was working in the White House, you start out in 1954 by saying N word, N word, N word. By 1968, you can't say that anymore. That hurts you, that backfires. So you stay, say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that, right, as code words. And he says, now you're talking about cutting taxes. So these, these things that we hear so much today about tax cuts and tax hikes and all that is very, it's not just about race, but that's always encoded in there. And so this sort of this notion of the, the hardworking white people um, and, you know, lazy, mooching, undeserving people of color and immigrants is always baked in. Um, and Reagan, of course, really masterfully to terrible effect, um, weaponized this against um, using black women as sort of the focal point um, against poor people and people of color more broadly by creating this sort of constructed image, this imaginary idea of the welfare queen, um, which has just done tremendous harm to, to people. Um, so on the next slide, just sort of summing up some of these themes that have emerged, right? So there's like this notion when we hear, when people hear government, government run healthcare is this term that's used all the time. They, all these sort of images get triggered and they get defensive, right? There's like, oh, it's this overbearing bureaucratic mess or like maybe on the positive side, this sort of consumer services agency, but that's really problematic too. And then there's this notion of where government just gets associated with people in power and, and they're imposing on my freedom, they're taking my money, this is anti-American. Um, and, and of course, this notion of sort of handouts to those people. Um, so even if the media is not intentionally advancing those kinds of narratives, what we'll see in a sec is that they've uh, unwittingly been pushed into adopting what are effectively anti-government uh, narrative. So on the next slide, these are some interesting um, leaked memos. Obviously, there's too much text here to run through, but we have a report on our website. Um, I'll share a URL with too in a moment. I think these were leaked by Wendell Potter, who I'm sure, sure some of you know, a former insurance exec. But the insurance industry around 1990 sat down and did had all these focus groups and polls and stuff and message tested how can we make people as resistant as possible to single payer? And then they used it against Clinton's health plan and the Affordable Care Act too. But they basically found that because this sort of notion of government and collective public action had been so poisoned in the public discourse, all they had to do was focus everyone's attention on government and distract from the fact that there are insurance companies and hospital companies and drug companies screwing people over, right? If they just said government, 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 um, they really turn people against whatever healthcare reforms are on the table. Um, so the most negative language to use when describing a public plan, they said, is a government-run health insurance plan. And they specifically targeted the media as one of their primary audiences. Um, so on the next slide, we'll see that uh, they ran these famous Harry and Louise ads. Uh, in, this was against Clinton's plan in the 90s, where um, Harry and Louise said, uh, they warned that the government may force us to pick from a few plans designed by government bureaucrats. And more recently, in 2009, during the fight over the Affordable Care Act, um, this is Fox News managing editor Bill Salmon. He sent out this email, which was later leaked to his reporters, instructing them, please use the term government-run health insurance or government option whenever possible. Um, so they really just wanted to focus people's negative attention um, strictly on government, which is like our, our public tool for um, meeting our shared needs. Um, and they had more allies in the fight. So in the next uh, slide, you'll see this is sort of the all the right wing think tanks. So the these on the left are examples from Koch brothers funded networks where they sort of um, stigmatize. These are in the 90s, so mostly against the Clinton plan, but also against California's fight for single payer. Um, and on the right, these are more recent examples of how they're still sort of using against Medicare for all, but also the public option, literally any attempt to um, try to move even slightly in the right direction, they're um, sort of lambasting these, these as anti-American overbearing government. And um, just a couple more here. So on the next side, the um, GOP itself, of course, has gotten very involved. So Frank Luntz and Alex Castellanos wrote these two influential memos to GOP operatives, instructing them on how to frame things. And so here's just a quick excerpt from Luntz. He says, the arguments against the Democrats' health care plan must center around politicians, bureaucrats, and Washington. 
Um, and then folks like Rick Scott started up these political action committees that were sort of keeping uh, Republicans in line on these talking points by threatening to primary them. And it got to the point that Senator John Cornyn, he was joking here, but um, he says, you get a fine that you have to put in a jar on the table if you say public plan instead of government plan. So they have been very disciplined and it's been effective. So on the next slide, you'll see, I did this um, search term for uh, government run health to see how often this appeared in media articles. And this term, terminology was like basically non-existent until you get this little blip in around 93, 94, the fights over California single payer and the Clinton plan. And then they really brought it up in 2007 when there was a, a media sort of fight over the release of Michael Moore's film Sicko. And then really in 2008 to 2009 over the fights over the Affordable Care Act. And so now at this point, this, um, this framing has just been totally mainstreamed in the entire mainstream press and even the progressive press. And what it does is it fixates people on government, 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 it, it, which as we've seen has these negative sort of connotations, unfortunately, and it distracts people. There's never mentioned are the insurance companies, hospital companies, drug companies. So our challenge of course is we need government programs. We need public programs. We need shared collective solutions to meet our needs. That's what Medicare for all is. And so how do we engage and try to shift the media discourse? And so Kenyon's gonna start us talking about that. Yeah. Uh, so the media, as you can see, <laughs> so we talk about uh, media, uh, you know, frames and um, how issues get sort of framed in terms of the mainstream media. Um, and so I often use this slide to sort of show, you know, oftentimes in cable news is obviously the worst, but it, it actually in some ways in this day and age has in some ways the most power and the most impact um, as, you know, daily papers dry up around the country and um, et cetera. I, per, so I live in Cleveland, Ohio, where we lost our, you know, award-winning newspaper last year because the company that owned it wanted to union bus. So we have a shell of a city paper that only now publishes three days a week. And we have, you know, this media company that then has the kind of cleveland.com website, but does far less work in terms of uh, the kind of local reporting that's really necessary. But so if you look at this slide, you know, obviously, you know, this, you know, kind of labor experts, right? And you have the three experts here representing major multinational corporations, which is often the way in which news is reported. The people who get picked to sort of, uh, you know, give sound bites or talk about the issues or to be perceived as experts, or sometimes they're former CEOs from these companies, et cetera, who then make a lot of money as consultants to do exactly that, to go on the media and kind of put forward the industry sort of frame. Um, but leaves, you know, obviously big parts of the conversation behind. So when we talk about frames in terms of, of, of both media and the press, and then also those of us who do sort of, so if you, any folks, uh, a part of this who are doing communications and media strategy work, one of the things I always sort of define, you know, frames as you literally the sort of like, if you think about a, a kind of a picture frame, if you think about a painting that you love, right? I, you know, you think about Sunday in the Park with George or something like that, where you see a particular scene. And the joke I always make to people is that like, you know, if you look at the, a painting like that, you know, you don't know as a painter was sitting there, like there were, you know, children screaming in the background or, you know, things happening off to the side, but you get a very specific view in a window of a particular day and moment captured that may not tell the full story of what was actually going on there, right? So, and that is how like media frames also work, right? And when we think about developing frames for media strategy, when we're trying to sort of move our frames and issues to the center, and not just responding in a kind of uh, defensive way to the existing frames. We can start first with what are our values, right? So that's one of the things. So I see there's a hand up. We're going to do our presentation. We'll come up to questions. We have about 20 minutes for questions. So just hang on uh, to, to questions for us um, and give the amount of time. So when we're talking about um, you know, media create like frames, um, you know, in terms of developing uh, messaging, you want to first start with what your values are, right? And what values you're trying to impart. 
Um, and again, and then when you look at the sort of news frames, those are the sort of stories that we see in the press that structure uh, the way in which uh, they structure those values and ideas for people, right? So here's some current like conceptual frames and then as they exist also in the media as media frames, right? So, you know, we hear a lot about job killers and job creators. And those are frames because they're not complete messages. They, but you hear those phrases used often by, you know, uh, particularly members of the GOP. And to say job killer, right, is really shorthand for a whole range of things that they mean by that, right? And what they usually mean is uh, labor protections or, you know, anything that takes resources out of, uh, you know, kind of extracting wealth into, you know, multinational corporations or the 1%, if you will, right? Obamacare, Romney care, those sort of things were used, right? To talk about um, the Affordable Care Act, right? So by labeling it Obamacare, the right wing, I'm sure did focus groups and tested that message to figure out what would be the thing that would make uh, their voters against that particular kind of health care reform, right? We also remember from the same era from like 2008, 2009, when the, uh, you know, kind of global market crash happened and there was a focus on the foreclosure crisis people were talking about having bought too much house, right? So it was as opposed to the predatory mortgaging that happened in communities, particularly in communities of color for 30 years, right? That led to, um, you know, this kind of uh, situation where people, and there were, you know, studies that were done that a lot of Black and Latinx folks who were given these uh, balloon payment mortgage plans had the credit that would have qualified them for a regular fixed rate mortgage, but they weren't even offered those in those discussions with those mortgage companies, right? So, th so these have become frames that like the ways in which that uh, a, a kind of a, a frame situates a whole conversation, right? A drain on the budget, talking about traditional marriage, right? When, you know, uh, as a way to sort of challenge, uh, you know, uh, same-sex marriage. Um, personal responsibility is certainly a big one, right? Education reform, which is usually about privatization of, of education systems. So those are the ways in which like frames then make them their way into like news discussions and, and shape like whole policy discussions and the way people understand like what's really going on and what the issues are, right? So when we think about health and health justice frames. I mean, we often hear these kinds of things. It's just some people or those people or the undeserving people, right? And it's often this sort of like individual responsibility narrative. So poor health is the result of a lack of initiative or it's an individual failing to eat right or to exercise or follow, you know, certain kinds of, of tropes. Um, versus, you know, thinking more systemically, right, which I think most of us would consider uh, to be the way to go. Thinking about poverty, you know, poor health and other social problems are systemic and not sort of natural or the result of, you know, people's poor decision making, right? Um, big government is bad medicine, right? We hear those, you know, kind of frames a lot, right? So, um, government, this sort of government is ineffective and inefficient and should be run more like a business. Or, you know, you just turn it over to businesses to, you know, to, to manage, right? And we see that obviously in Medicare and Medicaid around the country that most states have uh, what says it's Medicaid or Medicare up front, but it's actually being run by a private insurance company, right? As so sort the of state turning over money to private corporations to manage public resources. Um, right, we often, you know, we'll talk about a oh, government has a role to play, right? Um, the, you know, government and the public sector can be effective places to handle social issues, including um, health care, right? Um, government is getting between you and your doctor. I mean, how many times have we heard that in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years? Um, you know, uh, you often also hear this, we have nothing to learn from other nations, right? Um, and then, you know, we will counter with, you know, we want a system where, you know, we get to determine our healthcare system and not corporations, right? And as Ben mentioned, oftentimes the right will kind of focus on government as like the problem in all their messaging, right? But they don't talk about the ways in which 
corporations, right, from pharma companies to health insurance to, you know, PBMs, and we go really deep into the level of, of uh, you know, kind of companies and administrative pieces that actually are involved in every aspect of healthcare, but they dissuade people from kind of understanding that whole system, right? So I think, um, you know, those are some ways in which we think about, you know, kind of the, you know, sort of healthcare, you know, kind of messaging, right? And also, I think we should be talking about like helping people understand that really like your employer actually determines what kind of healthcare you get in most cases for people who are working or if you get healthcare at all, right? And, and I think shifting to that kind of message gets people to reshape where, you know, where they see uh, the issue. And I, I forget who said it, it might've been Asada Shakur, but somebody said once that, you know, the most part of organizing is knowing who to be mad at, right? And it's our sort of uh, uh, impetus as organizers and people who do communication strategy to create messages to help people understand who to be mad at, partly, right? Um, so, you know, um, there are obviously, you know, types of media. We think about traditional media, radio, TV, newspapers, and also, you know, podcasts, which also can be, you know, you know, run by radio or, or news organizations or whatever. Um, but those also are, you know, aspects of, of social media um, that we, you know, can use, particularly for those of us as, as uh, organizers and as, as activists, um, because they're tools that we actually have in our, you know, our, at our disposal to challenge a lot of the narratives and messaging through uh, mainstream media, right? So, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, blogs, podcasts, all these sorts of things as, uh, as uh, ways to uh, engage, you know, in the conversation. So next, we're going to talk a little bit about like, what, what can we do, right, given that history? And we're, it's, I think, important for us to also name, and I think for us to recognize when certain messages and frames are in are in kind of conflict. And I think right now, we're sort of have have some challenges in terms of messaging, but we also have some opportunities. One is that we have, uh, you know, a situation where we just we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic where all of the different ways in which governments lack of of responding, you know, through the Trump administration, I think has helped demonstrate to people what government and good government can do actually for folks, right? When you don't have a government that actually steps in and, you know, mandates, you know, manufacturers to make PPE, right? Or to make syringes or to make certain things to help us address a public health crisis. That's good, that's government, right? People see that, people see when a government doesn't, you know, uh, give people, you know, money to keep health people stay home and be able to pay bills because they can't work, right? Um, so these, these are sorts of things that are happening right now that despite so many government failings, frankly, actually point to some ways that had government done what government can do to help people, can help us actually shift some of the right wing sort of all government is bad, you know, sort of, sort of frames that we've been living under, frankly, for the last 50 years. Um, so uh, to talk specifically about relationships with journalists, so um, research the people who write about healthcare issues, right? And it's now in some ways easier than it ever was to find their contact information. You actually don't need a, a, you know, to pay lots of money for a media database. First of all, journalists move around too much these days for those, those things often are old by the time you get them now. Um, but most of them are on Twitter and have their work, you know, uh, you know, email addresses there. And you can sometimes have conversations in real time, you know, with and, and engage journalists who write about healthcare issues. Praise them if they write good stories. I tag journalists all the time, like this is a really good take on this issue. Um, I also tag them if there are problems <laughs> with their reporting and usually try to start with, uh, you know, more of a friendly conversation to tell them where I see things that are are erroneous or where they just lack. And this happened a couple of years ago where a journalist at Vox wrote a story um, about 
um, kind of HIV, it was a story about HIV and people who are, you know, kind of researchers and advocates in HIV, and they had no people of color in their original reporting. And I tweeted at the journalist <laughs> and said, like, this is great, but this is an all white list of, of people. And she went back and fixed it and interviewed some people. I gave her some recommendations and they, they actually republished the story. So sometimes you can, they will make those changes. Um, make yourself a resource to them. So if you build relationships and journalists know they can trust you, um, you know, as a source, they'll come sometimes just come to you and say, hey, I'm working on a story about something. I want to run this by you. Or a person, you know, told me this, you know, fact. And is this true? Or give me some context or whatever. Um, and again, as I said, knowing who to be angry with, right, is, is important. And one example I use here is like, we often sometimes read headlines and headlines, especially now in the 21st century, are so uh, just often over the top and just are clickbaity in, in that they don't really tell the story, but actually are uh, making things, uh, you know, over the top in order to get people to click on the story. Um, yelling at the journalist for those things is often the wrong person. Editors, and I have been an editor, so I know we write headlines. <laughs> so you want to find out who the editor is. Or sometimes if I tweet about a bad he headline, I might tag the reporter because they're usually easier to find. But I will say your editor screwed you over by writing this bad headline on what was an otherwise decent story and, and explain why the headline is problematic. Um, also knowing how to pitch a story. So knowing what's newsworthy to a reporter and what information to give them to uh, help them see a story as newsworthy if you're not responding to something that they've covered, but you want them to cover something, um, which is a whole skill and a whole nother workshop in and of itself. But, um, you know, those things certainly uh, can help. Great. Thanks, Kenyon. Um, just picking up on a couple things Kenyon said to go a little deeper on um, holding news and polling companies accountable. So just this notion of know who to be angry with, right? It is important to keep in mind that the media has been under attack. And I think a lot of journalists and editors feel this on a very deep personal level. So we wanna be careful not to attack them as people, right? But to, to look at the institutions that they're a part of and make sure that if they are repeating right-wing tropes or things that are really damaging that we're holding the institutions to account, the editors, the polling companies, et cetera. So on the next slide, I'm not gonna go into this uh, too in depth because there is a report and I'll share a URL for this. Um, but you know, a lot of the way this sort of subtle biased rhetoric shows up is this is a direct quote from, the New from an article in the New York Times. You'll hear things like, both proposals are clear that a single government run insurer would replace the private sector. And so what's the problem with this, right? They're fixating our people's attention on government and there's no mention of insurance companies. There's no mention of employers who have enormous power over people's lives. And so one of our goals can be to make those companies and their, what they're doing to people more visible, right? And so just simple rephrasing, like both proposals are clear that a single government run insurer would replace corporate run insurers. Suddenly those insurance companies become salient in the public discourse, right? And so there's little things that we can try to push uh, the news organizations on and these show up as well in public opinion polls too. And so we can push them as well. The other approach is like to have for them to use more balanced language is to call it public insurance or Medicare for all or something that's not triggering all these sort of latent subconscious racist anti American individualist stereotypes. Um, so on the next side, um, I'm, we could spend more time talking but um, if you go to parroting the right.org there's a whole report with sort of the background and more of these sort of like recommended framing tips. And then, um, oops, I didn't put the URL in, but if you go to <laughs> tinyurl.com slash drop the spin, um, I'll put it in the chat later. Um, that will take you to a social media toolkit we have as well. And I'm also happy to answer questions. So um, we can continue. Yeah, so um, just again, you know, some things that you can do, as I mentioned before, uh, make your own media, right? Um, now it's kind of easier than ever. You, we have much more available tools to be able to do so. So, you know, telling your, our own healthcare stories. Um, I'm probably gonna do something soon. I'm, I'm in one of the COVID-19 vaccine trials and given the amount of medical mistrust that exists in the country and particularly focused on African-Americans um, and as somebody who's written a lot about medical mistrust in African-Americans, 
uh, I, I'm going to probably do a video about my experience being in a vaccine trial, right, as an explainer. But so those are things you can do to tell your own stories. Again, uplift your values or uplift our values, right? So if the we understand the main sort of frame is about, you know, in one case, let's say personal responsibility, how do we talk about sort of um, uh, community and, and uh, you know, kind of keeping everybody and, and leaving nobody behind and these sorts of like frames that really uplift our kind of values and the kind of system that we, you know, want to create. Um, affirm uh, government and collective uh, public action, right? So again, that government can can do things that really support, you know, people um, everywhere, right? Uh, and then also to kind of really narrate and explain these races divide and conquer tactics, right? I think it's important to really call those things out for what they are and not try to, to sort of shirk them. And I, and I will tell you that in a number of cases and a number of sort of campaigns I've worked on a number of issues over the last 20 years, uh, you know, some sort of media consultants will often tell groups to not to avoid conversations about race or about LGBT folks or about other sort of controversial or not say abortion or about other sort of controversial things. And I actually think that does us a disservice, like instead of stepping into our power and naming things for what they are, right? And as we see them, um, because that's also helped the media, for instance, get away with, you know, not saying, say, Trump or other politicians are lying when we know damn well they're lying, right? And I, I think we're beginning to see that change a little bit, but, you know, we can certainly help sort of lead that. You know, make the profiteers and profiteering visible, right? So again, healthcare is very complicated, uh, you know, is the infrastructure that we have, but the more that we can kind of like, simplify but not distort the truth of it but to explain to people what the actual systems are that actually are making decisions about their own health right whether they you know know it or not so those are important and ways in which we can do that of course are you know using social media um i think creating like gifts and memes right and getting folks who really know how to do those things very smartly is a great way to do it. I'm laughing now because I'm just thinking about the Bernie Sanders meme for the last, <laughs> you know, with him sitting with the mittens and all the memes and all the things that got created in a very short period of time, right? Um, infographics, um, making videos, right? Pod, making your, or creating our own podcast, bumper stickers, still using blogs and newsletters, right? Um, as ways to, um, you know, challenge uh, narratives, put our own narratives out in the world are, are just, you know, ways in which we can, we can do things. All right, so and this is the last thing and then we're gonna move to Q and A. So if you have questions you want us to discuss, you can type those in the chat window. Um, just a, a, an example of sort of like uh, from recent years of that can help us sort of imagine how to make these profiteers, these companies more visible in the public discourse. If the media is not covering something or they're doing it in the wrong way, um, we can try to change a story through doing research on, on these profiteers and taking direct action. So this group pain um, came together because the reporting on the opioid crisis was just like, oh, people are dying, they're overdosing. Like it was just sort of happening by itself with no structural forces at work. And so um, a bunch of people, many of whom had overcome addiction or were, were working through it, um, came together and did research and found out that the Purdue family and their company, Purdue Pharma, um, was really sort of the worst driver of the opioid crisis of like really marketing and pushing these drugs on people. And they also found out through their research that the Purdue uh, family had a sort of political weakness, which is that they were uh, putting a lot of money into high profile art institutions, into museums. And so folks did these amazing direct actions. They did art installations, um, like pill drops, flyer drops, die-ins, these sorts of things, published um, materials to really call attention to what um, Purdue Pharma had done and that the complicity of these art museums um, in sort of uh, laundering their reputations essentially. And it was, amazingly successful. And so this is still an ongoing struggle, of course, but they they did manage to bring Purdue into the national spotlight. And so suddenly the media, instead of just saying, oh, people have overdosed, the story became, as we'll see in the headlines on the next slide, that like actually Purdue Pharma was really at the center of this, right? Um, so um, we, you know, the 
people may have sort of skepticism of government, but they sure as hell don't like insurance companies or drug companies, right? And I think there's a growing awareness that hospital companies are really abusing people too. So we have an opportunity <laughs> to change the, the conversation and direct action is a really powerful way to do that. Um, so we're gonna end the presentation there. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. We have about 10 more minutes and are happy to take questions. So um, I think we're, we're gonna look first at the chat um, to see if anyone has uh, burning questions that are coming up. Okay, see when uh, Kenyon here, do you have any advice on handling trolls and cynics who aren't constructive? That's a good question. <laughs> well, I, um, well, it, it depends on in what context. Um, so we're talking about like, you know, internet trolls, right? I generally speaking, don't engage them because that's what they want, right? And, and this, this is a change. <laughs> Because I, people, if you, if you, any of you follow me or on my Facebook page, you know I would go, I used to go really hard on people. But I have found that actually a lot of times the kind of comment sections or in tweets or whatever is not the best place for the kind of conversations that really kind of illuminate things and also uh, where you can actually really engage, right, in, in a way that comes to some di different understanding. So usually with trolls, I just usually don't, and I, I've said, this has literally happened a couple of times in the last few months where I've said to people who tried to kind of bait me into conversations about issues on social media or whatever. And I have said, I don't argue with people that I don't know in real life. <laughs> like I'm only, I will only have conversations with people and, and have debates with people that I actually know who they are and not some person behind a, a computer that I, I don't know who you are or where you, you know, anything like that. Or if they're, you know, bots, right, frankly, or, or, you know, parts of other kinds of disinformation campaigns internal to this country or external. And, you know, so that's just one. I just, I generally don't engage them. And in social media kind of um, projects that I manage, so like Facebook groups or things like that, I just, I just will block, I just will delete people. You create rules of engagement and if people don't follow, they gotta go. And that's, that's, that's simple. Um, thanks, Kenyon. I see a couple more questions. One is, um, how can we move, help move state campaigns? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, strategic questions about both winning Medicare for All at the national level and campaigns like the Campaign for New York Health. Um, in terms of narrative, I, I think it's sort of all the same, right? Like we're we're trying to affirm that <laughs> this is about our health. We're human beings. Like we all need to show up for each other and, and um, change the conversation against this sort of anti-government exclusionary rhetoric. But I'm here, I'm happy to talk more. Uh, Kenyon, there's uh, other questions coming in. Yep, um, I'm looking. Um... Wes, I'm happy to talk again. Just uh, shoot me an email. Do you have tools for the battling the MSNBC crowd? They don't realize they are being fed misinformation. Well, right. To me, it all it all is the same dynamic of 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 you know I'm willing to engage people because there's there's you know for instance there's a, there's a lot of the left frankly that's involved in a lot of medical and healthcare conspiracy theories just as much as right wing people are. And so you know th there's I will you know place facts in front of people. And I, I'm willing to tell people, well, this is actually what's going on here. But like, you know, um, but I think in terms of on social media platforms, it's really hard to really engage. And I think when you're really invested in kind of changing people's, uh, you know, opinions, it really is best for people who are close to people because that usually takes time, right? It's usually not one, not one tweet, not one fact you put in front of somebody. It's really about... In, like engagement over a long term, right? And so people who are close to people are going to be more likely to change a person's perspective than me random. Even if people kind of know me as a person, some sort of whatever <laughs> public figure or whatever the thing is. Um, I, if I'm not close to them, I'm not probably gonna change their opinion very much versus somebody close to them. So that's kind of how, you know, I see that. Uh, other questions.
Um, I'm seeing Paul's asking what five keywords should we be using over and over again? I guess I'm of the, I do think we want keywords and, you know, I think Medicare for all is actually a good um, phrase to focus on, but, um, you know, we want to, it's people, humans, health, like these are, we want to sort of change it away from like taxes, imposition, restraints on, on individualist notions of liberty. Um, so I think those are the times that, the, the sort of concepts to emphasize. And the other thing I'd say is just storytelling. We have so many powerful healthcare stories, right? And so sharing our own stories, getting them out there in videos, in infographics, like whatever ways we can, the more people are hearing other people's stories, they're able to connect like person to person and say, oh, I was struggling with this medical bill on my own, but it's not just me. Um, and so, so in addition to, uh, just individual words, I think that's a really important. Um, yeah, I would say one, like one example of how that showed up recently, and this was actually in this way, journalist driven. So uh, Sarah Cliff, I think a few years ago when she was still at Vox did this, where she asked people, if you've gotten surprise medical bills, you know, send them to me and created this whole series of stories and, and actually put a lot of hospital corporations um, you know, on the defense of having to defend, you know, some of the bills that people were getting. And our organizations can do that too. Use your social media to ask people questions about their experiences with any surprise medical bills or whatever, things like that. Are, are you in a community where there's no COVID testing, right? And people have to travel far. Tell me a story about, you know, you can use your meat to collect those stories and people can also then share them, you know, individually. Um, as ways to do that. I will say that just one in terms of messaging that, so the question like five messages or things that we should be saying, I'll, I'll tell you what I think that we should not be doing in addition to what Ben said, is I, I think we got to lay up on the old oh, look at Canada and, and Denmark and the UK or wherever. Uh, I, I don't know that that is working for us, frankly. I, I think it actually makes uh, seem as a movement, uh, you know, like a bunch of wealthy globetrotters who sort of know what, you know, like, and we're, a lot of people don't go, have never, you know, I knew, I lived in New York for almost 20, for 20 years, really, and I knew people who did not leave Brooklyn, right, and so I, I think that, like, we have to come up with a different way to sort of talk about what's possible, and I do think that we have things obviously that to learn from what other countries are doing. I'm not saying that like that kind of research or things, but making that our primary message about, well, they can do this in Canada. Like it, I don't, it's just, it, it just isn't working. And it's also not particularly, it clearly also to me is not addressing what I feel like we also don't really have, which is people, particularly speaking to communities of color about Medicare for all in any deep way and figuring out messaging that actually works there, you know, so I, I think I would just just add those things. All right, I'm I seeing see people two... shout out. Sorry, go ahead. go ahead, Kenya. I was just going to say people are putting in some other good phrases that I think are worth repeating over and over. So emphasizing that healthcare is a human right, that this is about our human needs, um, emphasizing public, uh, pu that healthcare needs to be a public good. I think those are all really good uh, frames. Yeah, and I think they also challenge the choice, right? Because it was what the right wing always talks about, you know, the, the choice frame. And it's like, do you really have choice in your health care? <laughs> How many times have you gotten an insurance denial, right? I just opened a, I submitted a, a bill to United Healthcare recently and I just got a thing back saying they weren't paying it. The, the $240 is on you, sir. So, <laughs> you know, I think like the more in which we point people to like, no, actually you don't have that much choice in the in the current context and you know under in you know kind of privatized you know corporate health insurance right they make those decisions and i think we have to point those things out to folks um we're just running out of time and i know there's hands i see other, i'm sure we no. missed questions in the chat um so i apologize but the you can reach out to us directly at ben at dignityandrights.org or uh, kenyan at dignityandrights.org. I'm happy to follow up. Um, I mean, this is an ongoing struggle we're all in together. And I will say, you know, it, it can be so frustrating sometimes seeing the rhetoric that's weaponized against us. But I think there's been this tremendous shift in just the last five, 10 years, right, in, in just sort of growing awareness and changing of the national conversation about um, about healthcare. And so I think we really, you know, 
we've been doing a lot of really great things and this is hard work and we got to keep it up but i'm actually um i don't think there's any guarantees we'll win but i i do think we can win um and so i'm hopeful that uh we can we can push forward on this and keep learning uh from each other and with each other as we go and with that we have to go thank you all so much for your time and um again please feel free to reach out to us um, you know, follow us at uh, Partner for Dignity on Twitter or Instagram or, you know, personally myself or Ben on any of those things as well. And um, let's hope we about to win, y'all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thanks, is everyone. Is there a way to get hold of the slides? Is there any way to yes. get hold of the slides? I will um, either post those on the conference page or email them out to everybody. Okay. Uh, probably I, not today, but by early this week, I promise. Oh, to great. That. Those were excellent. Just great. Can you Thank also you in the chat? Yeah, it, can you download the chat too, please? Yes, good reminder. Thank you. And the, Thank I think the so video much. recording will be available as well. Yes. Oh, Thank you so much. Well, well done. Very well. Yes, yeah, very well done. Very well done. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Announcing Thank you so the chat. Announcing the 